Adams State College. Great stories begin here. All right. Well, it's my pleasure to. I'll turn that off. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Amber Harlan and Joshua Michone. Uh, Amber and Josh were are both Porter Scholars, and last summer they started doing a bioinformatics research project with me, and most recently they actually presented some of this data at the 52nd <coughs> annual uh, Drosophila Research Conference where they uh, had a poster that they presented in front of an international scientific community. So they're doing some very exciting work and I'm uh, happy to uh, have them a chance and opportunity to talk to you guys today on their uh, project. Thanks. All right, I'd like to thank everyone for being here. Uh, our project specifically focused on the annotation of Drosophila mohavensis uh, contig 17, specifically within that the gene CG1909 and contig 27 with gene RFABG. So our subject of research is Drosophila, Mo, uh, Drosophila uh, specifically mohavensis and melanogaster uh, species. So just to kind of give you guys a, a little bit of background, uh, when we look at DNA, we see that we have portions of coding sequence and we have portions of non-coding sequence. And coding sequence is known as um, an exon and non-coding sequence is known as introns. And so when we look at this, these introns are spliced out before the mRNA uh, can be translated into the functional protein that we see uh, working in the cell. So when we look at sequences, we see that these exons and intron sequences are designated by AG and GT sequences, and you'll see more of this later on. And also, amino acids are what make up a protein. So amino acids are each coded for by three nucleotides. And so we see all the variations with the four nucleotides right here uh, coding for well, my pointer's off. Coding for the uh, specific amino acid. So again, we see that leucine would have multiple uh, types of codons. So a CUU or CUC would both code for a leucine. So we'll go ahead and start our annotation. Now specifically what we're looking for is to designate these specific sites. So what we first see here is we see the genome browser, and this is going to give us the specific genes and con uh, contigs uh, for this specific piece of DNA that we have received. So the portions in black, so the dark sequence that you see here and the dark sequence that you see uh, over there with the black are both sequences which uh, are, at, are what we can look at. So this is a gene and this is a gene over, over to the right hand side, which I really wish this pointer was working. Um, but, hmm. okay, here we go. All right, so right here we have this gene, CG1909, and this is another gene, but we're not gonna worry about it. So we see that there are two isoforms of this gene, which means that this gene can be spliced two different ways. And so what we need to do is we need to find these exons and introns for this specific gene. So the next thing we need to do is look at this gene finder and see if our genome browser is actually matching up to the correct gene uh, for melanogaster sequence. Uh, remember, we are looking at Drosophila mohavensis, so two different species, and then we are going to compare the two. So if we look at this, we notice um, a couple very important features. So we have nine exons, which if we were able to move the bar over, you would see that, uh, this bar over, that you would see nine exons right here. And that we, indue, we do indeed have two isoforms present. So our genome browser is matching up, uh, the genome browser of the Mohavensis sequence is matching up with the Melanogaster sequence, which is very, very good. So what we're going to do is export this exon sequence from Melanogaster, and we're going to compare it to Mohavensis. And we're going to do this using a program known as BLAST. 
And so what you'll see here is that our query sequence is our Mohavensis sequence. So we would take the nucleotide sequence from Moha, Mohavensis specifically, and we would place it in this box right here. And then we would take our subject sequence, which is melanogaster, which we already know all about, and we would do a blast uh, comparing the two. And what you would see is a little bit of a printout. Uh, here's a cutout of specifically exon 1, and this is kind of what you would be looking at. So right here, the important things to notice are that the length of this exon is not conserved. And what I mean is Mohavensis appears to be different than Melanogaster because this sequence is not showing up in uh, Melanogaster, we have a sequence of 12 amino acids, and Mohavensis, we only see 10, so basically we're missing two amino acids. So here it's going to tell, this, this is going to tell us the nucleotide sequence that we need to start with, and this is where it's going to end. Because we're missing two amino acids, we're not going to look at this insight. We're going to move further down on the nucleotide sequence because there's two missing, so I mean it's not going to be exactly what our BLAST sequence is giving. There's a couple other things that are very important that BLAST gives us. It tells us what frame we're in, and it tells us that our frames are reversed. So when we go back to the genome browser, we're going to, we're going to want to flip the sequences. Um, instead of having to try and read it backwards, we want to read it for, forward, so in the genome browser we can flip those. So this is an example of what I would look at. Now, this sequence up here is my Mohavensis sequence that I placed into the query. And then this black bar down here is the Melanogaster sequence. And there are a couple important things that we see here. First is that uh, we do have our ATG site, which is, designates a methionine, which is what all proteins begin with. Or Generally, most proteins, I guess, in biology, we should say most uh, begin with ATG. But anyway, uh, so we have our methionine start codon. Again, I said I was in frame three. When I say that, I mean these, these bars right here. This shows us what amino acid is going to line up according to the sequence of nucleotides. If you remember, I, t I spoke about codons earlier, and this is what we're looking at right here. So again, we are in frame three. We have our start methionine, and it just so happens that the Mohavensis sequence and the Melanogaster sequence are parallel. <clears throat> So then we need to find this end, the end of this exon. So we found the beginning, now we need to find the end. So what we're looking for specifically are GT sites. Uh, these are designating the ends of the exons. Uh, when I looked at my original BLAST, I had a different number than 37,633, but if you remember, I said that there were two missing amino acids, so I guessed adding on a couple well, I added six nucleotides to that sequence and said, I predict that the splice site will then be here at 37,633. And what do you know? It ended up being at 37,633. So that was great. Uh, what we have here in this lower part are computer algorithm programs that are going to take the sequence and analyze it itself. The computer is doing what your brain is doing, basically, and looking at it and saying, where, where are my splice sites going to be? Where, where are these exons starting and ending? And so, as you can see here, we have that the splice site predictor says, this is a great donor site. This is what we think is uh, going to be the end of this exon. So, we have uh, the first exon splice sites. <clears throat> so, the next thing is we need to move on to the next exon, and we can't just have two nucleotides and then three nucleotides from the next exon, then we wouldn't have a matching up uh, amino acid sequence. We need specifically three. Uh, so we're looking for a total of three nucleotides between the two exons. So what we look here, uh, at the end of one of our exons, we'll see that you know there's not always just one GT site in the obvious spot. Sometimes there's multiple GTs, so as is the case here. So we have a GT here and we have a GT here. It's important to note that we are in frame three, and we will be in frame three as well for the start or acceptor site of the next exon. And so. What we see here is, if you look at frame three, we have two leftover nucleotides uh, for this amino acid right here. In this one, we have zero. GTs and AGs are not included in the sequence, so you don't include them. So 
I have a phase of two here is what, is what I would say, and then I have a phase of zero here. So my AG site, I know, is going to either have to be three or it's going to have to be, or excuse me, it's all either going to have to be zero or it's going to have to be one to add up to zero or three. So if I look at my AG site for my next exon, I see that again I am in frame three and that we have one nucleotide left over. So because we have one, that means we need uh, the phase of two for the previous GT sequence. And so I was able to determine that this GT was actually the GT or the correct ending site of the exon. <clears throat> okay, so uh, again, I just wanted to show you that uh, we would continually do this throughout the uh, gene of interest code for the exons, uh, every single exon, and then um, for both isoforms. So I, I, did, I would find the splice sites for all the exons in both isoforms, and I just wanted to show you that, uh, excuse me, a middle, go back, a middle exon acceptor site, again, is this AG site. And again, what we can see here is that it's lining up exactly with uh, melanogaster, so we're, we're beginning to see some homology. <clears throat> so at the end, I would, I would go through that, and when I found the end of this gene, we're not going to have um, a GT site. Instead, we're going to have a stop codon, which would be TGA, TAG, and TAA. Specifically on this exon, we find that we have a TAA uh, at this designated site. Melanogaster and Mohavensis line up exactly, and so I am able to determine that this stop codon is the actual stop codon for uh, this particular gene and this particular isoform. So I would run this through the gene model checker. Uh, this is just checking all my sites to make sure that my nucleotide uh, splice and donor sites are correct and that I didn't just make a mistake. If I did, this would tell me that I failed, so I'd have to go back and start over. And then our final annotation in our genome browser will show our custom gene model according to what I found for the Mohavensis sequence. In this particular uh, gene, so CG1909, uh, contig 17, we find that uh, for isoform PA, instead of a total of 10 exons, which are found in the melanogaster sequence, we have nine exons. Now, this is important because when we look at later events such as translation, um, we're going to possibly see phenotypic differences in the proteins and this could later affect the uh, cell. So this is kind of how we can determine genetic diseases, looking for phenotypic differences and things of that sort. Okay, Josh. <clears throat> okay, so while we were annotating, we did come into a couple of problems. Um, the first one was that whenever we had our blast sequence, there was no exon that aligned correctly with the star codon. So that's a problem because that's what's initiating the whole protein synthesis to begin. So what we had to do was just go in and look for it manually. And then second, we had the premature stop codons, and we'll talk about that later after we get through the um, no star codon. So in gene RFAT G of the supplementensis, the genes of this would be melanogaster. The first exon is in a positive strand, and the first one is 25 amino acids long. So we're going to want to look for an exon that's similar in length, since they're closely related. And in the blast sequence, when we compare the Moavensis contig 2017 gene RFAT-G to Drosophila Moavensis, we find that we're getting a reading frame of minus two sort in the exact opposite strand and we're only lining up eight amino acids, so there's definitely a problem going on. So whenever we look in the browser, we see that up here we have the beginning of Drosophila alignment to the Moavensis <coughs> starting right here, and if you zoom in on it, there is absolutely no start codon in the vicinity. So the first thing I did was look downstream from the first exon and found some, but it was so far into the exon that if this was the correct gene model, it would be deleting so many proteins that you would have a seriously um, altered protein. So instead, what we do is we use these um, gene predictors, which use different algorithms to help find splice sites, star codons, like Anne was talking about. And three of them all line up on the same sequence. And when we zoom it up, we see that we have a star codon right here, which is why they were uh, all lining up in the same spot. 
in this third reading frame, there are absolutely no stop codons, which is what we're looking for in an exon. So the next thing we do is we look um, closer into it, so we get the exact coordinates of the exon <coughs> interest. So here's our ATG site. And uh, it's lining up exactly with the uh, gene predictors that we have. And then next we go to the end of the exon, and we see that the star codons over here, but we have a GT site right here. So our uh, exon would be ending right here. So the star codon would not be included in the exon, so that's a good thing. And if you count all the amino acids within those coordinates, we come out to 22 amino acids. So if you remember, the exon in malonic acid was 25. So 22 is pretty good, considering that we didn't even have an alignment to start out with. So the next thing we do is we ran it through the gene model checker. Um, we put in all the coordinates of each exon, and then the stop codon, and we ran it, and we see that the um, parts of the check that are pertinent to the first exon all pass. So this is the start codon, the GT sequence of the first exon, and then the AG acceptor site of the um, second exons, and we found that whenever we took the second exon, um, the phasing was correct, so that um, the first exon was a phase of one, the second exon was a phase of two, so it all lined up. So we had a um, very reliable um, gene model based off of simply looking at the gene predictors. So this is a great example of why you take students or human beings and actually do the annotation instead of letting computer programs do it only because there are going to be some places where there is very little information that you can use based off of the programming. So the next thing are premature stop codons. So in the translation process, a stop codon signals the end of protein synthesis. So if you have a mutation where you switch a codon that's coding for an amino acid like glycine or glutamine, and it switched to a stop codon, the protein stopped right there. So if you have a mutation very early in the protein, you get the majority of it that is not coded, and you get a very non-functional protein. So um, what we're doing in annotations, we're assuming all proteins are functional. There are no premature stop codons. So for instance, if we were phasing, and the sequence was reading left to right, if we chose this GT sequence, the stop codons over here would not be included, but if we chose this GT sequence or this GT sequence as the inside of the exon, we would have this stop codon in the exon, <coughs> which would signal early termination. So that's what we don't want. And if you put that into the GMOL checker, it will specifically have a parameter that checks for that. So every single exon in these, or exon coordinate with these, will be checked for to make sure there are no stop codons within it. And what you'll get down here is a premature stop codon found fail. So um, we would like to thank the Porter Scholars Program. They provide the funding for all of our research. And um, to Adam State College, uh, we had another section of finishing where we did a lot of lab work here. We also used uh, some of the computers here to do the annotation process. And we'd like to thank GEP, um, Washington University of St. Louis. They were the ones that provided us the training to do the annotations, the finishing, the um, data as well. All the data that we have and we input for our gene models, we send it directly to GEP. They double check it. They stick it in the database to be used by other scientists. And um, they're the ones that set up the contigs and all the information that we use. So if we have any questions. Mm -hmm. Adam State College. Great stories begin here.